Hello everyone and welcome back to Tishney's GT Sport Driving School. We're on episode number three now, which is going to be all about cornering. Um, of course, cornering takes on many aspects. Um, we've looked at two very strong links to cornering, which is breaking and accelerating already. Um, we're now look at, looking at very specific aspects of cornering. So we're going to look at brake balance first of all. That was brought up in the braking episode. Uh, brake balance has always had an effect on the ability or the car's ability to turn, um, how much it can turn in, etc. Um, it, it mainly GT six i really did notice that in gt5 it was there as well so changing the brake balance what happens to the car why do we get more understeer why do we get more oversteer so we're gonna look at that in terms of cornering gear selection we're gonna look at that as well now gear selection is vital because in some gears you may experience more understeer uh, and other gears may create a bit more oversteer a little bit more turning which is exactly what you want um so we're gonna look at why you may pick certain gears in certain scenarios versus other scenarios we're then going to look at turning in early versus turning in and late um, the strengths and weaknesses of both of those because a lot of the time people will turn in earlier than necessary uh, and that's because they're very eager to get into the corner and get out of it again and it can affect your overall lap time so we're going to look at that turning in late of course is basically running wide um, now there are positives to turning in a little bit later because you can normally get a good run out of the corner so we are going to look at that and then we're going to look at some unique corners. So I've picked out a few corners here. I'm going to just read the list. Um, now, Catalonia is probably the best circuit in terms of variety of corners and what, what it offers. So we're going to look at Cal Catalonia Turn 3, which is the long right-hander, into Turn 4, which is the sharper right-hander, which has a few more lines, and it's a very good overtaking opportunity. Um, obviously, that's a different episode, but we're going to look at the different lines you can take there and how the car balances through the corner. Uh, we're then going to look at Turn 9, which is the sort of fast right-hander, right hander onto the back straights now obviously that's a corner where you try not to break uh, and in reality cornering it the less braking you do the faster you're going to be so that's why we're going to look at that we're then going to look at turn 10 which is the hairpin of course uh, very slippy corner and uh, another one to look at especially in terms of gears we're then going to go on to uh, Seaside 2 Chicane. It's a bit more open of a chicane. Um, I'm doing the reverse because that's the one I've done most recently. Uh, and it does have some features which are, you know, good to look at. Uh, and we're then going to go straight into the sharp left after it, which, again, has many lines. I want to demonstrate how different lines have different strengths and different weaknesses. Uh, we'll then go to Suzuka. We're going to look at the S's, um, the after effects of the S's. So... Um, you know, the fact that the second, uh, the first S can affect the second, third, fourth S. So you've got to be careful. You've got to make sure you corner correctly. It's not necessarily always going aggressive in the first S. Sometimes it's better to just back it off a little bit, give yourself a good line for the second, third, and fourth part. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the 130R. Uh, so we're going to look at Spoon before the 130R, which is obviously a unique corner in itself because you go in to go out to go back in, to then go out, and obviously accelerate out the corner. So in, out, in, out. Um, obviously, we're doing the okie-cokie now. <laughs> uh, then we're going to Suzuka 130R. We're going to talk about flat out, you know, trying to nail that corner flat out. How sometimes taking a little bit of risk gets you a bit more reward in the fact that you don't have to break and that you can just, you know, keep your foot planted. Uh, we'll look at Fuji last sector as well because that's got lots of lines. Uh, Red Bull Ring, um, the first corner. I want to look at risk versus reward. Um, in terms of cornering because sometimes going aggressive into a corner can be beneficial if on the exit you can actually you know gain time or not lose very much so you can really chuck it in and not lose much on the exit so we're going to look at risk versus reward and then we're going to look at um, Lego Maggiore uh, hairpin which is camber versus non-camber because obviously that has an impact as well. And it's all about how you assess a corner. What can you do better in an individual corner to improve lap time? So we've got lots of stuff to look at and talk about. Um, so I guess let's get on with brake balance first of all. So here we are with the KTM Crossbow at Suzuka. Why am I doing this test here? Well, first of all, brake balance obviously affects braking. That's why it's called brake balance, you know. And we're looking at brake balance to the front, to the rear, and zero. Now, when we look at brake balance, even though it says plus five, if a car is set up so that the brakes are always all, like, literally all at the front, none at the rear, and you put plus five, obviously the brakes are still going to be towards the front. So when we look at brake balance, we're looking at it on a per car basis. So what you use for the KTM Crossbow may not be what you use for any other car. And I just wanted to demonstrate what happens when you move this brake balance for braking and also for turning, because it does affect turning, or at least I find it affects turning, which is why I'm doing this test. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at brake balance at a zero 
um, setting on the KTM crossbow. We're going to look at braking as we go in. So I want you to really monitor what happens to the car under braking, first of all. So as we come into braking, we're going to start trail braking. You'll see a bit of oversteer there. So the minute you see this, you could say zero. This car has a brake balance, which is more towards the rear. Rear brake balance causes oversteer. Brake balance towards the front causes understeer. But I also wanted to show you the turning because what I find quite often with cars is that brake balance also affects turning. And I, I'm not sure why this is. Um, I'm assuming it's a setting in Gran Turismo. It could be to do with tyre heat. So the fact that the tyres, uh, if you put the brakes more towards the rear, will get a bit hotter. It might make the car a bit more slippy. And towards the front, uh, tyres get too hot. It's not enough grip. Just understeers. But even so, there are the results. I did five attempts with this. There are the five attempts. I've just shown you the fastest one, 39.653. We're going to do the same for plus five and minus five. And you can see those tests there. So an average, I would say, you know, 0.7 basically, you know bang on 0.7 you can see we got three of those and 2.6s so we're going to go to plus five now now obviously we saw that the car is more towards the rear anyway on a zero setup so what we're expecting to see in the braking here is the rear to start sliding a little bit more so as we come into the braking zone there we go you could just see the rear trying to step out i'm controlling that with the brake pedal and then as we exit the corner we may see a bit more oversteer you just see a little bit of a twitch nothing major though you've really got to keep an eye out for these micro movements and as we come into the corners you're going to see the car moving a little bit more than it did with zero and again i'm not sure why the brake balance affects turning but it does affect it you've got to keep that in mind um, as we then come into here i've just gone a bit aggressive on this run just going to run a little bit wide we accelerate out the corner 39.665 so not that much different to the zero we move the brakes to the rear uh, and you can see the results there what you can say from these results is that plus five seems slower than zero and we'll get to the reason why when we look at the next brake balance which is minus five but you can see we got a 0 0.8 which was the first adjustment so we went from zero to plus five 0 0.8 so we instantly lost two temps to the zero because we had to get used to the car which is the braking because the braking becomes more oversteery uh, and then also the turning as well we're now looking at minus five so again, in the first test with this, with a minus five, I lost a lot of time. But this is the fastest test. Now again, look at the braking. You're going to initially see understeer. Straight away, you can see the understeer a lot more. There's less action going on with the car in terms of oversteer. Um, and the reason for that is I explained in the first episode of braking, a tyre can only do so much if you have 100%. If you put more braking towards the front of the car, the, the front tyres can only do so much. You're now taking away the ability to steer more because you're braking more and that's what i tried to demonstrate here you can also see through the s's it is very smooth there's a lot less oversteer than there was with the plus five and as you see we get a 39.515 remember if you have oversteer you're not going forward you are going towards the right here you see that's 0.9 first of all we had to adjust from a very oversteery car to a very understeery car 0.9 we then had 0 0.6 0 0.6 0 0.5 0 0.6 very good results there. I'd say that was the quickest attempt. But that doesn't mean that minus five is quicker than plus five. Doodle uh, commented on one of the videos, you know, he uses more aggressive brake balance because he understood how to control the braking when it starts to oversteer with the throttle. Same scenario here. You could maybe adjust yourself to do that. But I just wanted to show you a generic setup of zero plus five minus five. And you can see the times there now to get a good idea of what is happening. So brake balance doesn't just affect doesn't affect just braking, it affects the car as well in terms of turning. So do keep that in mind. I think it might be to do with tyre heat. It could be other things as well. It could be stuff in the background. We've seen ABS can affect other things with the cars as well. So just keep that in mind that brake balance doesn't just affect braking, it can affect the turning of the car. And as I say, but minus five, even though it's the quickest here, doesn't necessarily mean minus five is quickest on other cars. It doesn't even necessarily mean it's the quickest here because you remember, you can adjust your braking so that plus five becomes more viable if you start making sure you don't start the oversteering process under the braking. Remember, if you brake in a straight line, that's the most effective if it starts to oversteer. If you can correct that oversteer with plus five, potentially you could have a better, more pointy car with that brake balance. So do keep that in mind. What we're going to look at now is we're going to look at the Audi R8. And I just want to demonstrate how much of an impact brake balance can have with a more oversteery car like the Audi R8 Group 3 car it is very oversteering to braking and you're going to see the impact of that on one corner in particular at Dragon Trail Gardens. So the Audi R8 here we are at Gardens, it's Gardens Reverse to be fair and uh, we're at zero brake balance just look what happens as we approach this corner. So into the braking zone we go, braking, a little bit of trail braking, a little bit of a wiggle, nothing major there, we accelerate out the corner just steady on the throttle and off we go. Obviously, with zero and this car, you know it's very sketchy. 
we just uh, bounce the throttle a little bit there. So now we're on plus five. And again, this is just to demonstrate what happens with plus five just under braking this time, not affecting the turn, etc. In we go, into the braking. Look at the oversteer straight away. So even before we started trail braking, the rear is wanting to come out with the brake bounce of five. Um, so you can see that there straight away. Car wanting to rotate. So as you see, plus five causes oversteer. We now have minus five. Watch what happens with minus five and the understeer that we anticipate as we come into the corner. So again, same again. Look at that. No issues this time. No issues at all. Straight round. Very safe. We carry it out the corner. A bit aggressive on the throttle. But even so, that demonstrates plus five zero and minus five in terms of what happens with the car. So back to the spreadsheet we go. And I'll split the corner into three sections. We've got before, through and after. I say through, it means middle. Same thing, but as you go through the corner. And what I've done is I've put an example gear here. So what I want to sort of go over is how to break a corner down a little bit more with your gear selection to then understand what you should do during the corner. Now, obviously, when you are on a specific combo, this value will change for any given car. Even if it's group four at Interlagos, when you get to the same corner, this value may be different. I mean, a good example in group three is the Volkswagen Visual Gran Turismo car. You're normally one gear higher at least, maybe even two gears higher, depending on the corner. So keep that in mind. I'm just going to talk about how to break this down and then I'll show you some examples of maybe how to understand how to break it down that little bit more for before, through and after the corner. So here you can see we've got two, two, three. So I've put this example in because obviously after the corner, I'm saying it should be three uh, in order to maybe minimize wheel spin, maybe minimize uh, the turbo kicking in on exit. But perhaps before the corner, you want to be in two because you get a little bit more turning. Uh, the car slows down a bit more as you head towards the apex. So you go two, two, and then you're thinking, oh, I should be in third here. So maybe you change up. But you've got to remember, and we're going to talk about this in the next episode about weight transfer so changing gear will always cause movement in weight so do keep that in mind so you know potentially that might go like three two three so if that's the situation more than likely you probably want to just stay in third gear throughout the corner to give it a bit of stability sometimes when it's two two three maybe you want to shift just as you get to the apex to third gear hopefully have a stable car to do that uh, and then exit the corner absolutely fine. And remember, we're talking about braking in this section, braking and accelerating here, more bounce in the throttle, uh, and then accelerating here. So braking and accelerating. And these values are more than likely going to be different a lot of the time, a hell of a lot of the time as well. So do keep that in mind. But uh, let's go to the example now of what I want to demonstrate. So I'm going to demonstrate before the corner about braking um, and the gears and why you may select certain gears. We'll, we'll talk about the apex of the corner and we'll talk about accelerating out of a corner as well. Uh, so let's go to that example. So here we are with the Audi TT Group 4 car and we're at Dragon Trail Seaside. So what we're going to demonstrate first of all is braking. Now you're probably wondering why the hell are you demonstrating braking in the cornering episode? Shouldn't this be in the braking episode? Well, you are right a little bit, but what I'm trying to demonstrate here, as I just explained with the spreadsheet, is I'm breaking down the corner. So I'm just going to look at breaking towards the apex, first of all. And we're all about gear changes here. So I want to show you what happens when you break uh, and don't change gear, and when you break and do change gear. Are there any significant differences that we can find where we should be doing one over the other? And this is 100% braking. There's been a line, these clips, to when we initially start braking. As you see there, we change gear down at the bottom right side. There is no difference in terms of speed. So there's one question answered straight away. I know this bit gets brought up loads and loads of times. There is no difference. We then change gear down to first gear here. When we have a look at this, we've one mile an hour difference. But again, it's not significant enough in my mind. It could just be a slight tweak in the ABS that's happened. It's not significant enough where I would say do one over the other. And again, there's a slight difference here towards the end where actually the top left hand side now is higher than the gear changing one. But even so, there's no significant difference there at all in terms of slamming on your brakes, whether you change gear down or don't change gear down. So engine braking, not having a significant impact there at all. Obviously, engine braking when you're higher in the gear, uh, gears, uh, higher in the rev range in the gears should have an impact. So let's redo this test, but let's not brake this time. Let's just let off the throttle and see what happens. Because you remember, when I did the trail braking part of the braking episode, it was all about that you're not actually braking 100%. You're coming off the brakes so you turn into the corner. So this test now becomes very significant. What gear do I want to be as I head towards the apex of a corner? So as we head towards this line, again, they've been aligned. So the minute I let off, 
Well, the second I let off, here we go. So at the moment, they're identical speeds. Perfect. Exactly what we want to show in this demonstration. We're now going to change down on the right side, and we're now in to gear two now look at the difference in speed it is now 70 versus 74 and as we now head down there so we've just changed gear again maybe changed gear a bit too early there but even so this demonstrates it really well because now the speed difference is over 10 miles an hour so it is significant and one thing that you will experience is that when you head towards an apex and maybe you try and stay in a higher gear is you experience understeer this is why you experience it it's not because the car is understeering due to the gears is actually because you're not slowing down enough um, because if you stay in a higher gear and start trail braking you're not going to slow down as much as you are if you come down a gear so that is significant so that affects your gear choice now as you can see we're, at, we're now racing around the track and what we're going to do on this clip is actually just stay in the lower gears and this is all demonstrating about accelerating out of a corner as well as what happens during the apex so here we are down in second gear the minute we accelerate in this car with it being front wheel drive especially, this is the extreme of it, we're going to get a lot of understeer. So again, is it beneficial to be in that second gear or is it beneficial to be in that third gear? So as we come round this corner, you can see now we're flat, our foot is flat to the floor, we're accelerating as best as we can, there's a lot of understeer in, the, in there, you can really see that as we're now going to accelerate down to this bottom, uh, bottom right hander. And it's down here you will see it the most this is where gear choice is significant you've got to think about the exit of the corner and this is where the priority really lies with gear choice in a corner look at this i'm just understeering every time i accelerate i'm having to come off go on come off go on come off go on it's horrible remember you got to go slow in fast out so you've got to be sensible here so now we're going to stay a gear higher you got to remember this is car dependent okay car and track dependent so this may not necessarily work in other cars so in like in the ktm crossbow it was very significant due to the gear change delay to be in a higher gear because we're now trying to avoid the turbo in this particular car we actually want to be in a higher gear so here we go third gear we can now put our foot to the floor much easier now cars with torque at the lower end of their uh, transmission will experience a lot more oversteer so then potentially it's better to be in a higher rev range here you can see we've got no significant understeer from being in the higher gear because we're slowing down more we're using the brakes more to slow down rather than the engine uh, which you would use in a lower gear now we suffer a bit of understeer there again that's because we're getting towards the top end of the rev range so you're seeing that difference now the significant one here as we come down here we're going to stay in third gear this time uh, we turn in exactly the same place but as we accelerate out look at this so much better we can get on the power and we're accelerating out much quicker and that sector time is miles quicker so there is a significant difference between uh oh in how you select a gear you've got the entrance to the corner and i wanted to demonstrate that because that is brought up a lot why am i understeering in a higher gear it's because you're not slowing down as much as you should because you are in that higher gear uh, so at that point you then look at the mid corner so you don't really want to change too much in the mid corner because that transitions into weight uh, and weight transfer then becomes an issue in stability of a car we'll talk about that in the next episode but then you look at the exit of a corner and the exit of the corner is the most significant because you're accelerating out of that corner get a slow exit someone may overtake you get a slow exit you're going to have a really bad sector always think about the exit and as you saw there being in third gear a lower gear even though i'm not revving the nuts out the car being in third gear there was sensible in the Audi TT. In an MR car, for example, it potentially is more beneficial to be in a lower gear because you get more weight over the rear, you can accelerate out that bit quicker. So do keep that in mind with gear selection. That is why I was demonstrating the braking um, and just letting off the throttle there with gears. So now I want to look at turning in early versus turning in late because again, this is significant. I've always said this, if you turn in early, you're sacrificing so much on the exit. And as you saw there, the exit is the most important. So we're gonna look at turning in early versus turning in late uh, and just see how much of a difference it can make through one corner. So to do this, we head to Bathurst and in the Toyota FT1 Group 3 car and we're specifically looking at this first corner here. And as you can see, cones are on as well. The cones are going to help us standardise this test and we are only going to look at this first turn. Now, turning in early versus turning in late, it seems like an obvious choice in what to do in reality. But I wanted to demonstrate the difference between the two because one of the biggest bad habits in racing is turning in early. Uh, and just to demonstrate, because obviously this episode is all about cornering, I wanted to show you how much of an impact it can have 
just on one corner in one sector. Remember, the first sector at Bathurst is one corner. You will see the difference. Uh, and obviously, going up the hill here at Bathurst, you can see how, you know, if you do one or the other, could have serious impacts. You know, when you're racing, you can hit a barrier, you can lose a lot of time. So this is why we're focusing here at Bathurst, um, just to show you the real impact it has. So what we're going to do first, we're going to look at just taking the corner normally, using the cones as a guide. You know, we have brake markers with the two cones, then the one cone to turn in. Uh, we're then going to turn in really early, uh, and I was going to show you the big difference in the car, and then we're going to look at turning in late, and then compare the times that we have between those three. So let's jump to the first turn now. So we, as we head towards this last corner, we're not looking at this last corner. This is the standard run, right? Okay, so we're just going to turn in and break at the normal position. Try and turn in and hit the apex. No early turn in, no late turn in. Just standard. Break, turn in, where the cones are as well, to give you a bit of a standard idea. So as we break, get to the cone, we're turning in. Miss the apex a tiny bit, nothing major. We can accelerate out the corner, a bit of a wiggle. Nothing major with this car and a big, long acceleration period now heading towards the end of the first sector. And this is why we've picked this corner specifically, because you can see a massive impact. It's showing the extremes of what happens. And here we get a 19.161, just standard stuff. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna turn in a little bit earlier. And obviously, turning in earlier, if you think about a corner, the whole point of a corner is to straighten out as much as possible in terms of the angle. If we turn in earlier, we're really sharpening that angle up. So as we head now down, down, we're going to turn in much earlier. Look at this. We're having to straighten the car up and then start turning again. Now, because we did that, obviously the weight, and we're going to talk about weight transfer in the next episode, shifts in the car. So it makes the car very unsettled. We've also lost a lot of time and speed through the corner because we had to straighten up, turn, and continue on. And as a result, we've lost six tenths of a second to the standard turning that we did. Very significant amount of time. Remember, that's one corner and one bit of straight. We lost six tenths. So now we're going to turn in later. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this, obviously we know which one's going to be slower and which one's going to be quicker. But I, it's to demonstrate the reality of it. So as you see, we go past the cone this time, turn in, miss the apex a little bit more. Now the angle of the corner is still sharper than what it was on the first run. However, it's not as sharp as the turning in early one. So in theory, we still get a fairly okay run out of the corner and we cross the line with a 19.4. So there you see the big differences there. So 90.1 for standard turning, trying to hit the apex. We miss it slightly, but nothing major. We then have a 19.7, six tenths slower, turning in very early. And then we have a 19.4 for turning in late. Now it's literally, I, I couldn't do this even as, as good as I could. Literally three tenths gaps between them. So you can see the huge significance of turning in early versus turning in late. So quite often you will see the faster guys um, turn in a little bit later, maybe not hitting the apex as much because they can get a better run out the corner. And obviously if you get a good run out the corner, remember it's all about the exits in a corner. It's not about the entrance. Um, if you get a better run out the corner, there's every chance you can still make up a little bit of time or still have a chance of overtaking somebody. If you turn in too early, you're sacrificing so much speed. So you'll quite often see that. I mean, even on that first run, I missed the apex by a little bit. But even so, I still managed to get a good run out the corner versus turning in early and the car's getting a bit out of shape. And, you know, we're having issues there. Um, so that was to demonstrate turning in early versus turning in late. Obviously, turning in late is better in the large portion of cases. Uh, we're obviously not looking at tyre marbles and stuff like that, which can have different issues. But even so, offline is going to have less grip versus being on the racing line, which will have grip. Um, so even if both... Turning early and turning late or offline, turning late is still that bit better. So a very interesting test there for you guys. Uh, we're now going to look at some of the uh, the more unique corners um, within Gran Turismo and within the racing world. Uh, so let's start looking at those, and then I'll just you know talk about how I go through each of the corners, uh, maybe what to look out for in certain corners. Um, so yeah, let's get on with that. So here we are at Catalonia in the International Gran Turismo League race that we did earlier this year. Um, we're in the FT1 and obviously we're going to look at the long right hander here at Catalonia. It's a very unique corner. Catalonia has a lot of unique corners. We're going to have a look at this right hander first of all. This chicane obviously has an impact here. So what we're going to do, we're just going to uh, stop it here. And uh, I just want to talk about the angle. So obviously we're, I've, we've got basically 180 degrees. It's, it's less than that, but essentially we're going back on ourselves to then go into a sharper right-hander, which we'll look at as well. Now, normally with a corner like this, you would go in, out, in, out. 
basically. Similar to what Spoon, you would do at Suzuka. We're going to look at Spoon later on. However, because this corner opens up at the end of, of basically the angle, it's actually not worthwhile to do this. So the way you approach this, and you see this on Formula 1 as well, is to actually come in tight, try and stay tight for a little bit, and then extend the corner out to get the maximum acceleration out the corner. So what you're going to see here, if we just start it now... Um, is that uh, you'll see I turn in, I then come off the throttle and I balance in the throttle. I don't want any braking because braking obviously then unsettles the car a little bit. When I know I'm going to make the corner, when I've made the apex that I want to make, I then go full throttle and exit the corner as I've done there. So in terms of that approach, it's a very unique approach. I'm just going to stop it here. It's a very unique approach because obviously we've got... Um, a very unique corner, there's not many of these corners in the world, not even on Gran Turismo, in the world. Um, you're literally balancing the throttle, waiting until you have the right moment where the corner starts to open up to then fully accelerate out the corner. So you're staying tight to then accelerate out. Now this next corner is literally different. Again, again, it's sort of like a 180 degree tu uh, turn, um, obviously it's much wider than that. We're going back on ourselves again basically, uh, heading towards the start of uh, this corner we've just done. Uh, but this time it's tighter, and it it opens up a little bit, but then tightens again, so you've got to be very careful. So the way I approach this, again, is to turn in, and I like to stay tight initially, because what I want to do is try and reduce the angle on exit in order to get the best acceleration out the corner. Now, the best way to do that is obviously to straighten the wheel up. That way I can reduce any oversteer and accelerate out the corner. One thing you will see with this corner in any race that you ever see is that a lot of people get very, very squirrely on the exit because they're wanting to put the power down and because it's just uh, it just constantly wants you to put the power down this corner. So let's play this now and I can explain it as I go through it. So there we go. As we come into the corner and I'm going to dart right towards the apex. Trail brake in. Try and keep it as tight as I can. I'm then letting it run. Balancing the throttle now. And uh, at this point in the corner, so let me just stop it here. Uh, there we go. Just stop it there. 88 miles an hour. We're in the middle of the track. Um, now, you can be a bit more to the right and you can be a bit more to the left, but at this point, I'm trying to balance the car and try and use as much of the exit as I can so that the car doesn't spin out. Now, that's the one key thing here. The car can spin out very, very easily. Uh, and the whole point is you've got to straighten your steering. So, I always approach this corner the same way every single time. I'm trying to open up that steering and make sure that I do not lose the rear of the car because... In any game, irrespective of GT Sports or whatever, you are more than likely going to lose the car here at Catalonia because it's ever tempting to get on that throttle and get out of this corner as fast as you can. So if we just watch that now, you'll see I'm accelerating out. No issues, I'll straighten the car up and then gonna dart towards the right hand side. So we're gonna now go a bit, uh, well, go at normal speed and we're gonna head towards the next corner which is of interest to us, which is the fast right hand there uh, as we head up the hill, because again that's a unique corner. I mean even this is a unique corner. Catalonia is so good for unique corners and if you want to practice cornering, get on Catalonia. So here we go. I'm gonna go slow motion here. So basically with this corner I always use the end of the curb as the turning point or maybe a dab of the brakes and then turn in, but in this situation or on this corner I always try and avoid the braking. Again, similar to turn three, if you brake, you're going to unsettle the car a little bit. The less inputs you do, and the more you can just do with like less, so accelerator and steering, the more you will gain. I'm just going to stop it here, uh, just before we get there. And um, basically, if you reduce your inputs, you can get better at corners, because you don't have to then figure out your braking. You don't have to figure out trail braking. You don't have to reduce your trail braking by one, two, three, four percent. You literally can adjust it just based on your throttle input and your steering. That way you can get more consistent and that way you can improve on your cornering. It'll also make it easier for, to understand the car because the car's doing less um, and then if it is getting a bit oversteery, you can control that with just one input rather than two. Um, so do keep that in mind when you are thinking about corners. That's the reason why I wanted to show that corner because it's very unique. So now, as we get to this hairpin, again, another unique corner. We've got loads of brake markers on the right hand side, and I talked about identifying brake markers um, in the braking episode. So we're just going to brake as standard. Now, with this corner, because it's such a slow speed corner, you've got to think about the exit here quite a lot. And in every situation, we are thinking about the exit more than the entrance, because obviously the exit is where you gain the most speed. Slow in, fast out. That's the standard uh, method, method of 
rating. I can't even speak now. So, I'm just going to start this now. As we now come into the break-in zone. Again, you're just going to see me start to turn into the corner. I'm going to try and hit that apex. Just miss it. But again, remember, turning in slightly later is better than turning in slightly earlier. We're then going to accelerate out and try and get on the throttle as fast as we can. Notice how we straightened up that steering straight away to really get the power to the, uh, to the, to the tarmac. Notice it there on that slight left. Again, very unique corner. We try and keep full throttle. Can make a car very, very, very um, oversteery. That corner that we've just done there, very unique corner because literally you're staying tight. So in all the other corners where you're basically doing a 180 degree turn, we've sort of been going in to stay tight to then go right out. This time we're staying very tight to get out on exit because it's that much tighter. It doesn't open up like the other corners. So again, very, very unique. So we continue on now towards the chicane. Well, we've got a right-hander and then the chicane. Um, again, 90 degree rights are just standards, but obviously it impacts the chicane. So we don't use all the exit. We try and get over to the right-hand side. Now, with a chicane, the main thing you are trying to do with this chicane or any chicane is to straight line it. That is the what you are trying to do. Doesn't matter which chicane it is. Even with sausages there, get them in the middle of the car and straight line it. And the reason for that is it will be the fastest way to take the corner. And that's why we straight line it. And that's what we try and do on every given corner. We are trying to straighten the angle, reduce the angle to keep the more speed in the car to get through the corner. It's all about average speeds and getting out the corner as fast as we can. Slow in, fast out. If you keep a higher average speed through the corner, we get out the corner quicker. We get a quicker top speed by the end of the straight and at the next braking marker. So keep that in mind when looking at corners. So they're the unique corners of Catalonia. Let's go to the next circuit. So Dragon Trail Seaside 2, here we are. One of my favorite circuits actually. I do love this circuit in reverse. Now, we're gonna look at the chicane and then the left-hander after it. So the chicane, we just looked at a chicane at Catalonia. Again, this is just straight line in the chicane as best as you can. But obviously to straight line this one is a bit more risky. I'm just gonna pause it here. So, it's a bit more risky to straight line this one because you've got a barrier on the left and a barrier on the right, and they're bang on the apex. But, to straight line it the best you can, you have to literally be next to that barrier. You have to be just about missing scraping it, and that's it. So, there is a lot of risk in straight line in the chicane, and obviously, the, as you get better and better and better at the chicane, you'll be able to go faster and faster and faster. I've had people comment, how the hell do you go this fast through the chicane, Tidge? you just got to build yourself up and understand where the car is, which is why I use this camera. I understand the width of the car on the camera. On bumper cam, you don't necessarily get that same impact or the same knowledge. Uh, and then you want to straight line it. So let's look at that now. So as you see here, I turn in and look at this. I'm trying to straight line it and then turn to the right. I'm straight lining, get a little bit, a little bit loose on the rear, but nothing major. Again, it's all about straight lining it. And then we can carry the speed through the corner as uh, we leave it there. Now, so let's just break it just after the 150 there. So, this corner here is one of my favourites, if not the favourite corner in Gran Turismo at the moment. It is an unbelievable corner because it has so many lines. It is a very, very, very technical corner. And if you get it wrong, you are off. If you get it right, though, it is brilliant. And if you get an overtaking move done here... It, it feels amazing, especially if it's a very clean overtaking move as well. Um, so, this corner has many, many lines, and it's braking while turning. Now, obviously, that's trail braking. Now, if you trail brake the entire of this corner, you're going to have to brake really, really early. So, when you come up to a corner like this, where you have to brake while turning to get the best out of it, basically, it's just constantly sharpening this corner, constantly, constantly sharpening until you get the apex, and then you can accelerate out. And it basically turns into a hairpin, basically. So it starts off getting sharper, sharper, sharper into the hairpin and you come out. So what you have to do really here to get the most efficient benefit from braking is straight line it. So you want to straight line the braking as best as you can, which means you've got to brake on a diagonal. You point towards the, the, the widest part of the corner that you want to go to to then turn in. And you can have a bit of weight transition in there as well. So let's just play this now and I can just explain it a little bit more as we go through it. So as you see here, we stay to the right. We then straight line the braking. Look at that, we're straight line. We're aiming for that cone there. Aim for that cone. We then come off the brake, start trail braking. Try and get the car turned in at this point. Just miss the apex a little bit. Nothing too major. And then we can accelerate out the corner. So let's just pause this here. Bang, there we go. 
<clears throat> so did you notice that I aimed for the cone straight ahead? Because I know in Gran Turismo that's the turning marker they want. So I've got a reference point there. So if I break at the double cones and point towards a single cone, I can break. I've got straight line braking all the way to that cone. I can then start trail braking and start trying to turn the car. So I have 100% braking. I then go to 50% braking, 40%, 30%, 30%. And as I come off the brake, I can then apply the steering. So obviously as the brake's coming down, 50, 40, 30, steering is going up. 50, 60, 70, I can then get around the corner and accelerate out. So this is why I love that corner so much. And sometimes you will have to trail brake a lot more and take a different line. So maybe take the wide line in to try and get a better exit out. Obviously, that will have the better angle because we talked about turning early, turning late earlier on, where here we are having a slightly sharper angle, but we're getting more efficient braking. So we actually gain time in this scenario by just sh sharpening the angle that little bit more. So do think about that when cornering. Very unique corner, uh, but now we're going to head to Suzuka for some more interesting looks at uh, the S's, uh, Spoon and 130R. So here we are in the Formula 1 car at Suzuka. We're going to slow this right down in a second. But I thought this is a good example of where I can show you how going flat out all the time isn't necessarily the best way to do things. Because sometimes you've got to think about the whole complex of corners, not just one corner. So as you see here, we're in super slow motion now because this car is so bloody quick. We're going into the left-hander, we're coming off the throttle a little bit. We could go flat out there, but that would affect this right-hander. Now, because it's a small acceleration period here, it's actually worthwhile to make sure you're not over-aggressive on the first part of that, to make sure you're a bit more aggressive on the second part, so you can flat out this bit to then come in and then get a good line for the final part. Now, this is something I like to call like the after effect, um, where you're not just looking at one corner you're looking at multiple corners so what you do in the first corner may affect the second corner or in this case the first part of this s is may affect every part of the s is thereafter uh, and cause issues so again here for example i didn't run super wide there i uh, sort of went to the middle of the track and made sure i was on the right to get a really good line for this left hander which then allows me to absolutely plow through that left hander and keep the keep my foot flat to the floor and then i can continue accelerating on so obviously you've got Degna 1 and Degna 2 as well, which are significant corners. But we can't look at every single corner um, in the game because we'd be here all day. And this episode is already very, very, very long. Uh, this is a while ago as well with the F1 car when it was uh, slightly bit bugged in terms of fourth gear for the hairpin, for example, as you've just seen there, as we continue on. Now we're going to look at Spoon. So we looked at S's there and the after effect, you know, making sure you get the right idea of where you need to gain time and where you can lose time if you go too aggressive in one corner. Spoon is all about going in, out, in, out. Very simple, um, and it's all about keeping pace. But what you're going to see here specifically, which is why I've chosen this, is you're going to see the Ghost go quicker through the first part because it managed to get more speed. And look at that, runs right to the curb, gets it done well, but lost the rear a little bit, which affected the second part of the corner. Now, I reckon the Ghost is faster there through Spoon. It's just I didn't control the, uh, the rear quite right. But even so, that shows you, if you can get the aggression out there, so going in, accelerating out, getting right to the curb, and then coming back in again, you will achieve tons and tons of time. Because you're being aggressive, you're maintaining a fast average speed through Spoon. The average of Spoon is where your lap time's going to be. Not the first part, not the second part. It's going to be the average. If you can keep your average speed higher, your, your lap times will improve. Now, we're going to look at 130R now as well, just in one big long clip. This is a very interesting corner because in some cars, like the F1 car, it is completely flat, so you don't have to worry at all. But I have another clip after, which will then show it not flat. And of course, that is where we're really going to look at. So obviously we have a cone there, perfect example of where we can use the cone. We turn in where the cone is, and no issue for the Formula 1 car. Look at this, we're staying to the left, we're just preparing ourselves for the Casio triangle. Absolutely no issue here whatsoever but in other cars so in group three you know in group four some of the road cars you're gonna have to lift or even brake at 130r and the reason i'm showing the 130r is it's because it's about risk here it's about how much courage have you got to flat that corner in an f1 car you don't need much courage you can flat it in this now watch i'm lifting here i'm trying to get on the throttle as fast as i can notice for us used a little bit more to the left on the grass and runs a little bit more wide so for us used more courage there to gain a little bit more speed than what I did in that corner. I was a bit more safe with it. So you got to keep that in mind when racing on these tracks and looking at these corners, especially the ones that are flat out or nearly flat out. How much courage can you give? 
how much uh, of an angle can you reduce it by to make sure you stay flat? If you turn in too early, you're going to go flying off. If you turn in too late, you could go flying off. You could nail it quite right. You might be able to just lift off a little bit and then go back on. Something to look at at the 130R. Very interesting corner, very unique corner, uh, and it's one worth looking at. Right, we've got uh, three more corners we're going to look at. We're going to look at the Fuji Last Sector, then the Red Bull Ring, then the uh, Majore Hairpin, uh, and then that's going to be it for this episode. So, Fuji time. Now, we're going to skip the chicane, and we're just going to do the normal short version of the circuit, because we want to focus on the last sector mainly, and I don't consider the chicane a part of that, because I want to look at the many lines that are on offer here at Fuji in the last sector. So, as we come into this corner, there's only one line really for this corner, but after this corner is when it all goes crazy. So, obviously, you exit this corner, and you're going to run to the left-hand side. Now, it's your decision whether you stay tight or whether you go to the outside. Now, there's many different lines you can take because, again, this corner sharpens. It's very similar to the Dragon Trail one. It's just not as sharp as the Dragon Trail one. As you see here, I went out a little bit to come back in to then go out again. Now, if you go really tight, you're going to go further out. If you go wide, then you're going to come in a bit tighter. But that sets you up for the last corner, which, again, is the same as Dragon Trail Seaside 2. It sharpens up. So, at this situation, I've gone very wide to get a good run out the corner. It's very opportunistic to go up the inside there if you're going to overtake somebody. Or potentially in some cars, it's actually quicker to go on the inside because it's all about point and squirt the car out the corner as fast as you can. So sometimes it's always worth taking a sharper line. And then in this situation, in this R8, it was actually quicker to take the wider line. It just stabilised the car a little bit more, reduced the angle of the corner, and it allowed me to accelerate out of the corner. So the whole point of that Fuji last sector was to show you many different lines. So I showed you one line there, but explained all the other lines that are a possibility. And we did the same at Seaside 2. So now I want to look at risk versus reward. And for that, we're going to head to the Red Bull Ring. So what do I mean by risk versus reward? So at the Red Bull Ring, the first corner has a very open exit. Now, obviously, at Dragon Trail Seaside 2, for example, the chicane, the risk versus reward, sometimes it's much better to reduce the risk by not hitting the barrier to get the reward of actually making a lap. Here, for example, the risk of actually really going aggressive into the corner to then get the reward of a faster lap is much reduced because of the exit. So as we come up here to the first corner, we're in a group four car. What I'm talking about here is as we accelerate through the corner, we can be really, really, really aggressive and we can use the outside and just carry on with our line. That's what I'm talking about, risk versus reward. So when it comes to corners, you need to evaluate where you could potentially risk a lot more and gain a lot more in terms of reward, or even a little bit, versus where you'll only get a little bit of reward, but there's a lot of risk. So in that situation, you want to be safer, but where there's a, a little risk, but there is reward there, that's where you want to be more aggressive. So think about that when you are cornering. Uh, and we'll also look at that now in terms of Lego Maggiore. Uh, because there we're going to look at the camber of a corner and how camber can actually help you in a corner as well. So here we go as we head towards the hairpin. Obviously the hairpin is very well known in this game now. It's got a huge amount of camber and as we just talked about risk versus reward, when the camber is in your favour like it is at this hairpin, you can go absolutely aggressive as hell and the more the camber you use, the, the more aggressive you can go. So if you go towards the inside even further, you can really, really gain a large amount of time. So look how aggressive I go into here, and I accelerate as fast as I can, as quick as I can, to get out the corner. Now, it will unsettle a car, Camber, because remember, the weight is moving about because the corner is banked. So do keep that in mind when cornering. I know we've looked at a heck of a lot during this episode. It's nearly 50 minutes long, this episode, uh, but I'm hoping it's of some use. We've gone over the fact that, uh, you know, how braking works, gear change selection, um, you know, what gear to be in, the fact that you might suffer understeer because you don't brake as much if you're in a higher gear. Uh, look at what happens before, drawing and after a corner. Um, we've looked at turning in early versus turning in late, and we've also looked at some of the corners around the GT Sport world uh, and some of their uniqueness, you know, what to do in these scenarios, why I choose to do this, why I choose to do that, um, and everything in between. As I say, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Driving School. Very complex one is cornering. Um, again, any questions, fire them down below. Otherwise, I will see you in the next episode of The Driving School.